как одно participants in the room uh, sure we have more participants in the room uh, and a few participants here in zoom uh, session so you will just uh, appear in the screen in the big screen in the classroom and uh, colleagues will uh, listen to you and see your presentation on the big uh, screen uh, on the wall okay so, great i have a power i have a powerpoint so okay. So, uh, because Marie has some troubles with her mic, I can, uh, and with the speakers maybe, I can uh, introduce you briefly. Uh, dear friends, dear colleagues, uh, I am uh, happy to greet and to introduce to you uh, my friend and colleague Linda Cook. Uh, Linda Cook is professor from Brown University and since um, a few years ago, Linda also closely collaborates with our uh, International Laboratory for Social Integration Research at HSE. And I am very happy to have uh, Linda as our uh, research advisor uh, of our lab. and. Um, also uh, as my uh, co-worker and co-author and a friend. Uh, so uh, Linda's research interests uh, uh, embrace a very wide scope of very interesting issues related uh, with uh, related to welfare state uh, in communist and post-communist uh, Russia and other uh, states uh, that, that were communist and now became to be post-communist. Also, uh, it, uh, it is um, the uh, issue of inclusion and exclusion, uh, welfare, migration, disability issues, uh, family policies, and uh, many other acute uh, topics of uh, welfare policy, social policy, and uh, uh, inclusion. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Linda. Uh, I know that you have just finished uh, uh, to work on your new book. Uh, and uh, also you continue to work on our special guest edited issue of European Studies Journal uh, that all are devoted to this um, research interests uh, that I listed. Uh, so please, the floor is yours. Uh, we look forward to uh, listening to your lecture. Thank you. Um, I'd like to put up my PowerPoint and I don't know whether Marie um, can do that or can share the screen so that I can do it? Uh, it's uh, up to you. Uh, I mean, uh, I can also uh, help you if you just let me download it because I received it uh, in, in the letter. Okay. okay. Um, right, I sent it to you too. So uh, while um, Elena is, <clears throat> is, is doing that, I'm just going to briefly introduce my talk. It is on the United Nations Conventions on Rights of People with Disabilities in Russia, Diversity, Equality, and Accessibility in Progress. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the passage of, of the legislation. The, the um, <clears throat> Okay, hold on. Now I need to... Um, Okay, now just from beginning. Can we make it full screen? Yes, it is full screen as, as I see it at least. Uh, and you pl please just tell me next slide and I will uh, make it. Okay. All right. So um, this is again on the United Nations Convention. I'm going to talk a little bit about the circumstances under which the convention was was approved by the Russian government some of the major legislation that was passed in order to, uh, to meet the conditions of the convention, and, and then some of the results of, those, of that legislation. And I'm also gonna draw on one of the papers from our special issue of Europe Asia Studies on people um, in higher education and employment who are deaf and hard of hearing and give you some uh, current research on experiences of, of one group one specific group of people who have disabilities and, and what their experiences have been under the terms of, of the convention. So next page. Oh, so I'm very happy to be here. 
even if virtually, I wish I were here there in person. All right. So much of this I know will be familiar to, to you, but Soviet era policies, as you know, disabilities were defined as conditions requiring medical treatment. Categories were, were created to determine therapies and living situations for people with disabilities. Adults with work capabilities were given therapy and training and employed under quotas assigned to employers. And I want to say that since we will be looking at influences of international norms and practices, that for those people who were integrated into the labor force in the Soviet period, these policies were in some respects more, more progressive, more inclusive than those pursued in the United States and other countries that tended not to provide many work opportunities in market economies for people with disabilities. In the Soviet period, children with mild disabilities attended separate schools, but most lived with their families. These schools were in their communities. And this was also a, a part of the policy that was, that was seen as relatively successful. It did not integrate these children entirely, but it did keep them in their families, in their communities, and then in special schools that were designed to, to serve their needs. So it was a kind of partial inclusion. So next screen. Um, <clears throat> internationally and in Russia, those with severe disabilities were usually institutionalized before the 1970s. This was true in Russia, but it was also true in the United States and elsewhere. Families perhaps that had a lot of financial and other resources might keep children with severe disabilities at home, but for the most part, uh, they were those with both severe physical and uh, intellectual disabilities were institutionalized in most places. In the 1970s, international norms and practices began to change. There was a move toward deinstitutionalization. Disabilities were seen, were redefined as a social rather than a medical condition. Children were mainstreamed in public schools, which meant that they were either integrated into classrooms with children who did not have disabilities, or at least they had classes in the same schools as those children. Adults were integrated into communities and services were supposed to be provided there. Now, internationally, these policies have had a mixed record of successes and failures. Which I'll discuss later, but mainly I want to say that in the United States in particular, as in Russia, these deinstitutionalization policies had both a humanizing logic, uh, making the lives of people with disabilities fuller and better, and also a neoliberal logic, uh, reducing the costs of, of caring for such people. And in the United States in particular, with the adults who would deinstitutionalize, Community services were never adequately provided, and many of these people have uh, now lived on the streets, served time in jail. It has been a partially successful and partially failed policy because the resources that were needed to, to provide for those people, to care for them in communities, have never been adequately provided, even in our most progressive states. Okay, next slide. Okay, policy reform in Russia. Uh, Russia, the, the Russian policy did not change much in the in the decade or so after the 1970s. The first major reform was in 1995. It's called on social protection of people with disabilities. It mandated integration of people into communities, and some urban social service centers began providing therapies and resources on a modest scale, but then partly because of the economic and other problems in Russia at that time, there was not a lot of progress for the next several years. Then next slide. Um, okay, the first, okay, the, <clears throat> the, in 2008, the Russian government, however, signed the UN Convention on Rights of People with Disabilities and in 2012, it ratified, it officially ratified that convention. This ratification was seen as a watershed event in, in approaches to understanding of and policy toward people with disabilities. 
It provided a broad set of rights in access to public spaces, education, employment, life opportunities, rights to a family, individualized services that were to be provided in communities. Ratification was broadly endorsed by movements of people with disabilities, and it was supported also throughout most of the expert and, and official community. But many, we, we did interviews on this question in an, a project with Elena um, in 2018, and some officials and experts were concerned that the introduction or the ratification was too rapid, that there hadn't been enough preparation, that responsibilities would be placed on ministries and government agencies that weren't yet prepared to fulfill them. So while there was support, there was also some hesitation about how rapidly, in fact, rather unexpectedly, this um, the convention was ratified. Um, next slide. So three major policy reforms followed ratification, the Accessible Environment Program, which began actually in advance in 2011, building entrances, sidewalks, transportation, especially for public buildings that provided services, health, education, social services, et cetera. And that program has been extended to the mid 1920s. The second on education, and federal state education standards for students with disabilities called for inclusive education at all levels from preschool through university. Um, and then employment rights, there wasn't so much a major piece of legislation, but a large number of new rules and directives requiring that workplaces be equipped uh, for people with disabilities and that uh, they be included. I should say that with the economic transition, as many of you probably know, the, the quotas for employment of people with disabilities in the Russian Federation really collapsed along with much of the socialized economy. So these pe people had been had had fewer opportunities to work in the in the regular labor force in the years after the transition. And now this legislation was requiring that they again be given access. Next slide. So results of the reforms, just briefly tangible, I would characterize them, they have been characterized as tangible but limited. Accessible environment in 2018, the government reported that there had been significant progress, that more than 50% of their priority sites, which were um, in facilities or buildings that provided healthcare, education, cultural and social services, had been made accessible. And clearly some of them have. But people with disabilities who were interviewed or surveyed expressed considerably less satisfaction with their ability to access most places. There was an NGO work that helped with work placement reported that inaccessible transport and communication barriers were the most serious problems for people with disabilities who were seeking employment. A UN report in 2008 um, focused particularly on remote and rural areas where a fifth of people with disabilities in the Russian Federation live, where distances are large and resources are few. And in these places, accessibility was, was very limited. And I, I, I'm sure that that's quite the same in the United States. And to some extent in other countries that have rural areas, it's very difficult where distances are long to provide full accessibility. Okay, next slide. Inclusion in education. There was significant progress in creating inclusive education almost from scratch in, in 10 years, in the decade, in the early, that should say 2000s. There were really only individual and experimental inclusive schools in some cities. Um, in 2011, 
just before the passage of the convention, there were about a thousand inclusive general education schools in Russia. By 2018, there were almost 10,000, 20% of the total enrolling more than a quarter of a million children with disabilities. And numbers had increased in post-secondary schools and universities, all this according to a, a study by the United Nations. Okay, next. Limits of inclusion. <clears throat> One of the problems with, um, with implementing or compliance with the UN convention is that the convention requires a spectrum, a range of services for children with different categories of disabilities. And there are many categories from physical to intellectual to psychological, many different types and degrees of disability. And our interviews, he said, told us that funding was simply insufficient to develop such a broad spectrum. That up to this point, I believe Russia, the Russian system had recognized eight major categories of disabilities. The UN recognizes 22, and in order to expand and differentiate services uh, to that full spectrum was really a daunting task. Secondly, most schools that accommodate children with disabilities are in urban areas. Um, this is a, a, a scholar, Russian scholar named Va Valiva, has found that the market of educational services is extremely narrow outside of major urban areas. In small towns and villages, children with disabilities are often left out of the educational system. And I should add that because education is largely funded and administered at regional levels, it also has depended a lot on, on the discretion of regional governments. So even some quite affluent regions such as Tatarstan have done almost nothing to integrate children with disabilities because the regional leadership has simply not set it as a priority. Okay, next slide. Um, obstacles to inclusion. Our interviews pointed to several obstacles, limitations of knowledge, scattered research institutes, weak development of interdisciplinary approaches in Russia. And this, I mentioned before that there are 22 categories of childhood disabilities recognized internationally with specific needs and accommodations. And Russia historically has recognized fewer. And so again, that differentiation has proven a major obstacle. Uh, next slide. Regional financing of education is also um, a limiting factor at a number of levels. Most education, as you know, is funded at the regional level, uh, along with other, most other social sector spending. It is highly decentralized, and Russian regions vary greatly in resources, even with federal subsidies. The amount of money that they have to spend on social services per capita varies very, very widely. So regional inequalities contribute to large differences in the numbers of specialized schools. Some regions simply can't afford much differentiation. Um, according to one of our interviewees, then it is impossible to evaluate the effectiveness of the policies adopted in compliance with the convention at the national level, because outcomes differ on regional and even municipal bases, depending on resources. So generating a kind of national average of the percent of schools that mainstream children with disabilities or the, or the numbers of facilities nationally uh, does not reflect the, the great level of differentiation at different regions. Some regions, some wealthy urban areas have concentrations of these resources and poorer rural areas may have almost none. Okay, next slide. Employment 
Russian employers remain resistant to hiring adults with disabilities. There's still widespread discrimination. In the, the paper that I'm going to cite, a number of interviews were done with, these were all people who were deaf or hard of hearing, and interviews were done with them about their experiences when they went and applied for jobs or sought jobs. And very often they, they felt that although they were entirely capable and communication could easily have been done in writing with phones, but often employers simply didn't want to deal with, with, uh, with unfamiliar unfamiliar disabilities with having to develop different ways of communicating with these employees. And that alone excluded them irrespective of their training or education or other qualifications. Some people were seen as, as qualified for jobs. They were about to be hired when uh, the record showed that they had hearing impairments that they they were told that they were no longer that they were not qualified. The employment gap between able-bodied and disabled people in Russia is one of the highest in the world at almost fifty three percent. I'm assuming that the world there means you know Europe and OECD countries because I think we know very little about these issues for many of the less developed countries. So it's, I would say it is on the low end for developed countries. Most adults with disabilities remain dependent on state benefits rather than income from employment. And this serves the purposes neither of the state nor of most of the, the people who want to work and become independent and earn decent salaries, but simply don't have that possibility. Next slide. Okay, so here I'm drawing on um, a case study done by Nikita Bolshakova and Charlie Walker that will be published in our special issue of Europe Asia Studies next year. And it was on experiences of deaf and hard of hearing students through vocational colleges and into work. And what they found was, despite the legislation, despite the liberalizing legislation, choices open to these students became more and more limited at each stage of their education. De jure, according to the rules of Mintrude and the labor ministry, they were entitled to choose from 333 different professions, but de facto, according to the All-Russian Society of, of the Deaf in 2016, they had some possible access to 74 specialties, which is, you see a small fraction, perhaps a quarter of those that should be accessible. Next slide. So they, the case study that, um, that Nikita and Charlie did was based on research, but also a large number of interviews with, with students and young people who uh, were deaf or hard of hearing. And they looked at, they, their purpose was to explain how their choices were limited, how the choices of these young people were, were limited in practice, what kinds of obstacles and factors they, they confronted in trying to integrate into the, uh, the regular labor force. These, um, these students, most of them were absolutely normal or higher intelligence. Their limitation, their own limitation had to do only with hearing. And really, as the UN Convention says, that has more to do with social obstacles than, than with um, the people. So first, um, the researchers found institutional factors that shape the vocational track. Although students with disabilities have some opportunities to be mainstreamed in regular schools, in their study, which was done just a couple of years ago, still 90% studied in special schools for deaf and hard of hearing students, partly because, uh, because those, student, those schools did accommodate them, all of the teachers and other students could sign or and have other methods of communication. 
these were much more accommodating environments in which the young people, the children could learn. But at the same time, those schools had more limited curriculums than most, uh, than most regular public schools. They did not, as a rule, prepare students for university or to compete in university admissions. In most cases, the students' parents had gone to similar kinds of schools and also did not have university education or the kind of social and intellectual capital that comes with that education. So the specialized schools scared, steered the students into associated vocational colleges. In fact, many of them just perceived that they didn't have a choice, that they were simply advised by their teachers to go on one track and didn't realize that they had even the possibility of moving on to a different track. These are institutional factors. And secondly, that as I said, specialized schools do not generally prepare students for university. Many of them perceive that it's not possible or that it's not allowed for them to go into a more academic rather than vocational track, despite the education reforms. Okay, next slide. Then there were cultural factors. Um, <clears throat> The students tended to follow their peers in order to maintain a familiar social environment that would accommodate them. Having gone through schools that, that were accommodating, they were familiar with communicating um, through sign language and other means. And to remain in, envi in an environment where that kind of communication was institutionalized and also where they had friends and peers who also could communicate with them through signing. Um, adjusting to new institutions for any student at this age is somewhat daunting. And for these young people, staying in a familiar environment where they could communicate with others was a priority for them, even if it meant perhaps fewer opportunities. So ability to sign by teachers, peers, and friends was one of the most important factors determining their choices in educational transitions, maintaining social and communicative environments. People in the deaf world have close ties and a common language. There is, as you know, a, a, a conception, a community of, of, of deaf culture. And at least in the United States, there, there, are big, there are huge struggles over those who want to mainstream children and people with disabilities or use surgeries, co cochlear implants to make them hearing. There is a lot of resistance among the community of people who are deaf and hard of hearing, arguing that they have their own culture, their own language, their own means of communication, and that that should be recognized as a separate and uh, respected culture. And I don't know whether you have quite that debate here, but I would be interested to know. Next slide. Another way that their choices were limited. So colleges or um, post-secondary schools were supposed to provide training in, a, in a, a variety of professions, but the school simply found it impractical to hire interpreters for a, for a track, for a, a program in which there were only one of, or a few students. So they tended to channel their deaf and hard of hearing, sorry about the acronym, students into one or a few programs. So again, while the, while the rules and laws that were passed after the convention was approved, provided on paper a much greater range of opportunities to these young people in practice, both in institutional institutions that were still in place their own sort of cultural choice, understandably, to remain in an environment in which they could communicate resource constraints and the practices of these schools, which thought, which whose administrations thought, you know, we can hire one or perhaps two interpreters. So we need to channel um, our students who need sign language interpreters into one or a couple of programs. That's, uh, it's just not feasible, or at least we're not willing to spend more resources on more interpreters. 
the uh, many schools can't extend translation to more than one program. So the majority of courses are, are not designed to accommodate deaf and, or hard, and hard of hearing students. Next slide. Um, transition to the labor market. So here there was a further narrowing of opportunities because of structural obstacles and discrimination. Again, as I said, employers were often unwilling to adopt enabling forms of communication. And although even given the limitations, these young people had been trained in a range of, of, of skills, um, of vocational skills, some of them quite advanced skills. In fact, most of them were limited to work in factories or supermarkets in which in where it was seen that it would not, not a lot of communication or complex communication would be necessary. So, so their opportunities become even further narrowed. More Their education should provide them more opportunities in labor markets, but the unwillingness of of, of employers and others to deal with the communication issue um, becomes yet another obstacle. They face discrimination in pay. Most cannot find jobs corresponding to their qualifications. So the transformative promises, though they matter, though they have provided some additional opportunities, have been mostly disappointed. One more slide. Okay, um, Russia also in other places as well, also do rely on some level of continuing institutionalization, though it is much less. Um, social service systems still favor institutionalization for children with severe disabilities and intellectual impairments. And again, this is not a problem confined to Russia, but every place, um, to have to make available in communities and public schools, the services needed by these children is very difficult. In some of the more, most affluent communities, it's possible. Um, I knew, I knew a, a little boy who was very, who was really universally impaired. And there was a school in his town that accommodated such children even without, he, he did not have speech or, or ability to walk, but there was a wonderful school that he was able to go to. And, but that was in a very affluent community. And in most places, one reads all the time stories of parents who have children with these problems, who struggle constantly to get enough services, appropriate services for them from, um, from public schools and public authorities. And, and I also know some people who have had these struggles. Um, it's very hard for parents to find resources in communities in Russia and elsewhere. Uh, the Human Rights Watch in 2014 estimated that about 30% of children with disabilities in Russia are in orphanages. Uh, so many thousands of people remain in institutions. Um, okay, next slide. Conclusion, a little bit more upbeat. Um, there are still big improvements over Soviet times. The rights of people with disabilities are recognized by the government and by society. There is activism and agency of parents who have children with disabilities who bring these issues to the attention of the public and of legislators and of, of and of. <clears throat> of local and regional authorities. And, and those parents, though it's a struggle, it is a struggle that's recognized and accepted now that the society does have a responsibility and an obligation to provide services for people with disabilities. Public officials openly express concerns about the needs and inadequacies of current approaches. One more. Okay, and grassroots organizations, non-governmental organizations and others are working and helping to overcome exclusion and stigmatization. 
through a, a variety of kinds of programs. Disability issues are raised in petition campaigns and have been addressed by Putin in his national broadcasts. And <clears throat> recognition and attention of the executive is, is I, I think, probably the most important the most important element in, in getting political attention and, and redress to grievances. And socially oriented nonprofit organizations under the new legislation that integrates them into provision of social services are providing individualized community-based services for some people with disabilities uh, through the, the outsourcing contracting system that has made some progress. And so there is movement forward. It faces a lot of obstacles, but, but it is ongoing. It does have support, some support at the top of the political system. It has now a strong legislative infrastructure. And as in most other countries, it's a matter of more activism and more pushing um, in more getting people to realize that those with disabilities have lots of abilities as well and can do most of the things that other people can do and, and want to. So getting acceptance and recognition um, remains a, a major obstacle. Um, I'd be happy to have you ask questions. I'd also be interested in particularly on this issue of hearing impairment whether there is a debate in Russia over the issue of, of, what, of integrating this community or accommodating it as a separate community, as a kind of separate culture, which is quite serious here. I mean, um, okay, so. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yes, thank you very much, dear Linda. Uh, you raised uh, very important and very uh, up to date, up to date questions uh, about the implementation of all these beautiful norms and uh, uh, plans, strategies that are uh, prescribed by United Nations Convention, and they are somehow reflected in national legislation in Russia and other countries, of course. Uh, and uh, your question uh, at the end uh, is uh, very, very um, uh, sharp and correct uh, because uh, we have to think about the agency, uh, who is in charge actually uh, uh, of uh, this implementation, only authorities or also uh, uh, public uh, movement uh, activists, um, uh, organizations that provide services or um, organizations that uh, uh, conduct human rights uh, activism, uh, or even we as scholars can be uh, uh, can pronounce our voices here and uh, and actually where uh, uh, we can hear the voices of uh, persons with disabilities themselves. So, um, dear colleagues, uh, who would like to ask questions or to comment uh, uh, this uh, presentation and this question by Linda? Uh, I know that um, we have, uh, I mean myself, I can just uh, say a few words uh, because we, um, together with my uh, colleague Olga Verbilovich uh, and with Francesca Chiarvesio, we are thinking about this uh, issues, uh, how uh, public sphere is uh, changing uh, uh, when we uh, consider it uh, in the lights uh, of this uh, topic, disability rights, disability um, uh, situation with disability uh, rights. Uh, so uh, starting from uh, maybe Soviet Union and early post-Soviet uh, period, transition period, we can see that the public sphere was uh, mainly uh, um, characterized by representation uh, of uh, the voices of people by dis with disabilities by elites, by mm -hmm. um, politicians, uh, some maybe um, um, uh, important persons uh, who also had disabilities, uh, but at the same time they were uh, 
visible in politics. Uh, they were members of parliament or they were maybe um, some um, um, heads, uh, leaders of uh, official organization uh, of, dis of people with disabilities, such as All Russia uh, Society uh, of the Blind, uh, All Russia Society of the Deaf and of uh, the Disabled. These uh, persons were uh, represented in public sphere. Uh, also, we can see that um, uh, public figures without disabilities also uh, use this resource uh, to promote their political position, to promote their um, visibility, their image as politicians. When they, for example, publish their photographs, uh, how they present uh, gifts uh, to children with disabilities, to families, uh, to uh, elderly, maybe veterans uh, of the war, uh, with disabilities. Uh, so this is uh, the, like chronologically first uh, uh, type of this public uh, public discourse, public debate, public discourse uh, on disability. Uh, the, another one was uh, developing since 90s and, and nowadays uh, it's more like uh, liberal, liberal public sphere when, um, when journalists uh, and uh, uh, persons with uh, uh, like from a new electronic media, uh, bloggers, uh, 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 some of them are uh, also uh, highly educated and uh, professionals with disabilities, such as, uh, for example, TV journalists, uh, uh, book writers, uh, very, very famous uh, lawyers, uh, and uh, those who were like uh, invited to Kremlin uh, to be also present there, but they are more like um, critical. They, they, can, they can pronounce critical position. And now the other models also are present uh, nowadays, uh, more in later, uh, in, um, later times, uh, such as uh, discursive model when the harsh critical uh, discourse uh, is presented when discussion is possible. Uh, there are also public scandals that challenge uh, this um, picture, this uh, status quo. Public scandals when um, uh, persons, uh, uh, usually persons without disabilities, pronounce openly um, um, hate uh, speech against inclusion, against uh, people with disabilities, a certain type of disability, when they make laugh, uh, I mean, when they uh, make uh, humoristic uh, uh, <laughs> sent sentences, sentiments, or not sentiments, but uh, messages. Uh, and then the public scandal evolves. Uh, and uh, it helps uh, uh, to uh, highlight, to reveal uh, certain uh, issues that were unpronounced or hidden, or they just they were not thought through before. And then also the, the very new phenomenon is uh, when the, this public sphere is constructed and reconstructed, when uh, people with disabilities uh, 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 also are uh, associate themselves with some radical movements such as feminism, uh, queer uh, agenda and so on. And when they can challenge not just uh, discriminatory discourse against the disabilities, but also uh, patriarchal hegemony uh, uh, in general, because uh, uh, in, in mainstream discourse, uh, they they criticize the the image of a person a woman for example woman with disability as a, a weak uh, feminine um, creature without uh, any agency so uh, and and this public sphere develops in uh, uh, mostly in social networks uh, and uh, people uh, uh, who are um, like uh, initiators of this discourse they are uh, not uh, professional journalists, uh, but they, they became bloggers, they became leaders of opinion, and they form uh, circles of support around them and, and social, build social networks and promote this critical, radical feminist or, or uh, 
queer discourse, uh, uh, so-called queer uh, kinship. Uh, er, er, about disability issues. So these are briefly my uh, thoughts uh, about the publicity, public um, reaction uh, to these uh, changes uh, on, on political agenda. So maybe maybe other colleagues can also comment. Uh, maybe Nikita, or Alexander, or Maria, and I, I don't know if anybody else can. <laughs> during this discussion. And, and of course, there is a matter of this, uh, um, like, uh, uh, differentiation between, uh, uh, between uh, different uh, elements of disability movement, so to say, uh, disability civil, civil society that is uh, uh, concerned uh, uh, about disability issues, such as, uh, for example, official disability organizations that are supported by the government, uh, uh, some uh, new SONGOS uh, or this uh, non-profit organizations that uh, became service providers and they like balance between this welfare track uh, and this security track trying to promote uh, human rights and at the same time be uh, part of uh, official agenda with service provision as a priority. Uh, and uh, also this uh, grassroots that uh, not necessarily uh, aim uh, to serve some uh, needs, but uh, their uh, primary goal is to like pronounce their position, their position in public sphere. Uh, and maybe there are some other uh, also, uh, and, and sometimes they are absolutely different uh, in, in their ideologies. They are not necessarily liberal or social democratic. They can be very conservative. They can also promote some conservative ideas, uh, uh, familialistic uh, discourse and so on. Mm. So this is <laughs> what I wanted to say. Maybe you have some something to add, or maybe Maria Andrea, Maria or Nikita or Alexander can also comment. No, maybe they have. Maria said they have difficulties with uh, uh, speakers and microphone, uh, but uh, and Nikita he ju has just joined us because he was busy with other uh, panels. Uh, but uh, I'm very glad uh, we could have a chance to hear you, to uh, have your presentation. And thank you very much for uh, preparing. Yes, me ask Nikita a question. Yes. Nikita, are you here? No, is Nikita wants to ask you. Is Nikita here? Yes. Uh, yes, yeah, here. yes, yes. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm here, but uh, yeah, I. I've just joined the presentation. Sorry, I, I haven't heard it. I just wanted to ask you a question, though. First of all, thank you for letting me use some of your research. But I wondered, in the United States, there's a, there's a, a big dispute among the hard of hearing and, and deaf community between, integrate, between whether people should integrate into the rest of the society or whether they sh they should have the right to live in a in a, a a deaf culture that has its own language its own means of communication its own norms a kind of separate culture that they should be recognized and respected as a separate culture and these people in particular are very much opposed to cochlear implants or any kinds of surgical interventions to make children with hearing difficulties here. Um, and I wondered, is, is there a dispute like that um, in Russia as well among the hard of hearing and deaf community? Um, sir, could you repeat your question, please? I я могу быстро повторить. Им заинтересуется, если вы меня слышите, Никита, насколько в России, так же как в Соединенных Штатах Америки, распространена вот эта вот такая дифференциация между теми глухими, кто за кофлеарные импланты и теми, кто против, 
И насколько вот это вот сообщество глухих, оно как бы замкнуто, социальное закрытие какое-то происходит. Как раз вы писали вот о культуре глухих и о различиях, да, установки а... на эту нормализацию, так сказать. И жестовый язык, по-моему, здесь тоже имеет. Да, по-английски отвечать или по-русски, я не знаю, есть перевод? Uh, do have а у нас, translation может, может, Андрей, это как раз переводчик, да, Андрей, вы переводчик, да? Линда, у нас okay. есть heavy translation, interpretation? It's okay, Russian is okay. Uh, я могу. Окей. Okay. Okay. Uh, ну, uh, в целом, я бы не говорил о том, что есть какое-то прям uh, четкое разделение внутри сообщества на тех, кто uh, поддерживает uh, условно кохлеарные импланты и не поддерживает кохлеарные импланты, потому что, как правило, как раз uh, история про кохлеарные импланты – это история про тех, кто вообще не внутри сообщества. То есть это, это люди, к, имеющие достаточно... Ну, это люди с нарушениями слуха, не включенные в сообщество глухих. Поэтому внутри сообщества как такового разделения нет. Внутри сообщества это в основном как раз те, кто ну, за жестовый язык и как бы, да, вот сплочены как раз, если мы будем говорить про культуру. Спасибо. I can briefly summarize, uh, if you'd like, uh, that uh, Nikita said that there is a community of these people, and they are uh, uh, absolutely against these uh, implants. Uh, and those who have implants, they are not insiders uh, for this community, so to say. So that there is, so we can even not say that there is a division, <laughs> because the community is. Uh, like uh, coherent about it. Uh, I even, yes, and those who are in this community, they are for, uh, how to say, uh, language, uh, how to say it in English, Nikita, gesture, uh, sign language, sign, sign, sign language. language. Sign language, yes. So they, they prefer sign language. And there is also, uh, I think, uh, uh, in, uh, in, in the, the rest of the society, in wider society, um, Uh, I don't know, uh, what Nikita knows better than me, what is about uh, attitudes of teachers uh, in uh, special schools and mainstream schools concerning this uh, sign language. There are also some conflicts, uh, as I think. Uh, yep, uh, it, it's, it's very complex and honestly, uh, sign language is still uh, officially forbidden at schools. Uh, you, you cannot use it officially in Russia. Uh, you mean in it, schools, in special schools or in mainstream schools? In special and both in mainstream schools, of course, mm -hmm. because it's, um, uh, there is no sign language in GOS, in federal образовательные стандарты. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Мария Андреевна, have you questions? Уважаемые коллеги, у меня сейчас слышно стало? Да, да, да. временем, да, наладили все с микрофоном. Я хотела поблагодарить Линду и поблагодарить Елену Ростиславовну. И, может быть, чтобы какой-то позитивчик внести в завершение по поводу репрезентации разных людей с разными потребностями. Я хотела привести пример. Значит, у меня вот несколько, как многие тут знают, исследований контента школьных учебников. И я делала исследование учебников общества знания в 2014 году. То есть 2014 год был таким ключевым не в политическом отношении, а в образовательном. Потому что после него проходили оценку Министерством образования новые комплекты учебников. То есть в 2014 году они поменялись. Одну секунду, Линда, uh, have you switched on the translation? Because we have simultaneous translation. Oh, no, how do I do that? Uh, you, have, uh, you have icon, a uh, small icon with a globe uh, uh, down on the bottom, uh, on the bottom, bottom of, of the screen. screen. More what? Globe, this uh, oh. globe, like. Oh, uh, okay, hold on, I, I, let me find that.
verb. Oh, I see. Yes, no. and then and then choose uh, English. Okay, because great. Because Andre is interpreting. <laughs> okay. Good. Okay. Ну, Мария Андреевна, а можете самое основное? Вот, да, значит, есть? учебники общества знания до 2014 -го года. В учебниках с 5 по 11 класс люди с инвалидностью упоминались вообще три раза. А инклюзивное образование и вообще инклюзия один раз. И, и то в задании, в специальном задании со звездочкой, не обязательном для освоения. В учебниках 2020-2021 года ситуация значительно изменилась, прямо кардинально изменилась. И, во-первых, изменился дискурс репрезентации людей с инвалидностью. Там остался в какой-то мере момент такой героизации, но... Ну, он, в общем, тоже ну, существенно так сузился, и скорее это говорится в таком контексте о каких-то примерах из прошлого, 19 и начала 20 века. В рассказах о наших современниках, людях с инвалидностью, ну, в общем, вполне такой инклюзивный дискурс, равенство и поддержки участия в разных социальных институциях. Правда, в учебнике 2020-2021 года по сравнению с 2014 годом, ну, как бы сказать, в негативном направлении изменилась презентация людей с миграционным опытом и людей с низким социально-экономическим статусом. Но это про другое уже, так что сегодня мы <смех> про это говорить, наверное, не будем. Это отдельная большая тоже. А, ага. Yeah, I mean, the, the, I think in education the, there's a difficulty because people whose children don't have disabilities are sometimes resentful about the resources and accommodations needed for those with disabilities. And, and so there's always a tension between, between those, those two groups. And I think young children are taught now much more tolerant attitudes. I don't know though, whether they retain those attitudes into adolescence. I think there's a lot of acceptance of children with disabilities in early grades. I, I don't know that that really continues very much into the later upper schools. Um, universities are very accommodating though. Anyway, it's it's just a, an ongoing struggle to, to get, to get recognition and acceptance of, of making accommodations that are necessary. But I'm surprised that sign language is prohibited. That, that we would never do. All right. Um, uh, yes, it's a very contested area. Uh, all this uh, uh, discourse on inclusion, now uh, becomes, beca becomes uh, very fas fashionable and uh, much used in uh, political discourse, in public discourse, in uh, self-representation of uh, various organizations, uh, different projects, grants are allocated uh, towards this uh, uh, projects that contain this <laughs> uh, concept in, in the title. And of course, uh, everything is uh, to be uh, analyzed <laughs> and uh, uh, I thank you very much uh, dear Linda and of course dear Maria for organization of this panel and of, of the conference as a whole. Uh, I think uh, uh, we discussed uh, very important issues and uh, we, we, we recorded this lecture and uh, I expect uh, much discussion afterwards as well. Uh, and publications also uh, we will uh, expect after this conference. Thank you very much. Linda. Okay, thank you. Maria, could I get access to some of the panels tomorrow? Thank you.
Да, Мария, Лига спрашивает, можно ли получить доступ, ссылки на завтрашние панели. Вот для меня это тоже да. не все было понятно, как, где найти эти ссылки, как организовано это. Так, сейчас я тогда остановлю, наверное, видео.